I'd like to take a look at this question here to give us a chance to practice linear regression and interpreting the parts of a model in addition to making a prediction from the model and working on the skill of practicing the language and how we do those things. So in this case, we have a chart right here that gives us the energy consumption for the US and China for various years. And we're tasked with creating linear regression models at years since 2000, and then comparing the e-intercepts, we're going to use e for the output, we're going to use t for the input, u for us, c for china, and comparing the slopes. Then we're going to make a prediction about when they'll be the same, and we'll discuss those. So I'm going to write most of this in the decimal screen, so I already have the data sort of typed in over here. Um, as soon as I can get my decimal window up, there it comes. All right. And over here, you see that I have my data typed. Now, uh, if I zoom over on my data for right now, you'll see it's way out there in the 2000 range on the x-axis. So I'd have to scroll quite a way to find any y-intercept. I'm not going to even be able to pull my mouse over there. So that's not what we want to do, and we're going to change that right away. Anytime we're working with data, we want to work years since a certain value so that our y-intercept has meaning. We do not want to work with x values as large as 2000 and something. So we're going to immediately subtract off the 2000 since we were asked to talk about years since 2000. So this will be 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, and 8. Now even if you are not told what year to use as your starting year, you're going to have to pick something. Pick something that is close to the beginning so that you can work with years since. We usually do tell you, but that's a task that if you're not told, you will still need to choose a year to work from so that your y-intercept has meaning. So now I'm going to zoom fit again, and now my data is a lot closer to the axis, so I'm going to be able to get a meaningful value for the y-intercept. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and change these labels up here, because the variable names are going to be uh, t for time, and u for the US data, and c for the China data. That just helps us keep our table organized, and so we, when we look at it, we know what this column means. Instead of trying to remember what y represented, we can look back at our table and get some sort of variable sense of what we meant here. So t for time, u for the US data, and c for the China data. Okay, so now we're going to make the regression equations. So the regression equations, I'm going to start with what I remember to myself, is that I know if I want to make a line, this data looks linear. Later on in different chapters, we'll deal with data that's not linear and fits a different pattern, but this data is linear because it has a general upward trend, or at least a constant amount of increase or decrease heading across. Okay. So I start with what I know. I know that y is equal to mx plus b. Now that's what a line looks like. I just want to think about what the equation looks like, and then I'm going to modify it to match my table up here. First of all, because I'm doing a regression, I'm not going to be using the equal sign. I'm going to be approximating, so I put the approximation sign in there. And then the independent and dependent variables have to match the table. We have called our independent variable t, so we're going to change that to t. We've called our dependent variable u, if I go for the u model first. Call it capital U. Here we go. Now, depending on if you want to refer back to the slopes m and b later, then you may want to make them different. Instead of just m and b, if I define m and b twice, I won't be able to use them again, if that makes sense. So let me use m1 and b1, and that's going to keep our slopes distinct. So it's going to be the slope for the first line and also for the second line. Okay, now we'll write our China model. With what we know up here, we're going to do c is approximately uh, slope m, but let's use m2, that way we have two different slopes. It still times the independent variable, which is still t, plus our y-intercept for this model. We've already called b, b1 in the top one, so we'll call b2 here. Okay. So that just keeps them distinct, so if later on you want to write down what m is, you can do it for each one. You can say that's m1, or if I wanted to know m2, I could type in m2 and get the slope values. If you used m for both of them, then you wouldn't be able to do that because they would, they would be defined twice. It wouldn't have a single meaning. So it's optional, but I like to do that in case I need to figure out what the slope is later on and not want to scroll up. Or if I want to use it and add something to it or multiply by something, I can keep that value there. Okay. So those didn't graph, uh, so I'm going to turn those back on. I had them turned off a moment ago when I was setting this up, so now I just turn them back on with the uh, folder I kind of turn them both on at the same time by letting this folder graph. Okay, 
Now, there are two ways to see that these are good models. It didn't specifically ask me to do that, but I'm going to write this down in here. So I'm going to write it under each one of them. So first of all, the U model, let me color code these a little nicer so that they pop out. So I'm going to make the U1 red, and I'm going to match it down red here, and we'll make the C model blue, and we'll match them down here. Okay. So now that that's the same color as the line, and it helps them stand out. Okay, so does the red line fit the data well? Why, yes it does. It's very close to all of the points, and it has an excellent R-squared value. This R-squared value is a moderate positive correlation, so we'll say that... Um, this model is a moderate, oops, I forgot to make it a note. Moderate to positive correlation because you have an R value of 0.8 something, so moderate positive correlation. So it is a good fit, it's not a best, it's the best fit we could have gotten. Uh, it's not a strong correlation, but it is the best fit we could have gotten with this data. Okay, so it is still a good fit. And let's look at the C line. Okay, so in the C line, again, I don't see a whole lot of difference in the distance the points are away. There's a couple that are a little tiny bit further away on this one as well, but the fit is a bit stronger. So this is a, with that 0.99, this is a strong, I have to make a note, hold on. This is a strong positive correlation. And it's also a good fit. Okay. So things are going to become poor fits when they become weak correlations. And again, the regression is still the best choice, but perhaps we would have to examine a different type of regression type, or maybe a weak regression is the best we can get. So these are good fits. And it, we have one moderate correlation and one strong positive correlation. Okay, so the first thing that we were asked about is the e-intercepts. All right, so the e-intercepts are going to be here and here. And so the first, I'm going to write them above so that I can get them to graph. So the first one is um, 0, 0,96.636. And actually, uh, instead of typing the 96.636, I could have, since we're right, was careful to name these B1 and B2. I could have just typed B1, right, because it knows what B1 is. And I'll ask it to label it. And then I will type uh, 0, comma B2, since B2 is the y-intercept there, the 31.3, and I'll ask it to label it. Okay. I'm going to flip both of those labels so that they're on the left and um, make them small. Okay. I'm just resizing those as well. And so I have those graphed. Now I'm going to fill in some details about what they mean. I started writing it so you have to watch me type all of this. The US has an E intercept of, and so here I'm going to write in my ordered pair now that I can see it on my graph. So it's 0, 0,96.636, meaning that in, okay, in the year that we're calling year zero, that's our starting year. So in 2000, the energy of the U.S. was 96, that should be a decimal point, 96.636 quadrillion BTUs. That's what the E intercept means. So we put both values in context with their unit in a nice little sentence there. Okay. China has an E intercept of 0, 31.287 meaning that in the starting year, which year zero was 2000 in this case, the energy consumption in China was 31.287 quadrillion BTU. Okay. Now, one more statement that we can make is that based on the E-intercept, we can say that in the year 2000, the U.S. consumed more energy, right, because it's E intercept is a higher value. Its vertical intercept is a higher value. If we really wanted to, we could subtract and say exactly how much more it consumed, but for right now, um, we wanted to at least make the comparison to say that it is consuming more energy. So this is going to be our E intercept discussion. Talk about each one, 
what happened in what year, and then make a comparison between the two of them. Oops, this was 2000. I put, didn't put enough zeros there. So in 2000, the U.S. consumed more energy. Now let's talk about slope. Okay. Now slope, let me, again, I can't, if I scroll back up, I can look at my m values. But if I just want to, just to see them again real quick, I'm going to type them. So m1, that was the U.S.'s growth rate. So energy consumption in the U.S. has a growth rate of, and that growth rate is 0.5. Uh, three, four. If I want to just keep three places, that's fine. 0 0.534 quadrillion BTU. That's the growth rate of the U.S. So I want to make sure that this growth rate, which is a slope, but if I'm talking about in context, it's always going to be a growth rate because it will have units. And the units are quadrillion BTU, that's the unit on the y variable, per year, that's the unit on the x value. Okay, now let's go back and change this to M2 so we can get the number for China. So the energy consumption in China has a growth rate of 6.607 quadrillion BTU per year. Now I don't need this line here anymore, I was using it to get the numbers, I can either Keep it or leave it, lose it, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to lose it for right now. And then we're going to do our comparison. So energy consumption is growing at a faster rate in China. It's growing at a much faster rate in China. So half a quadrillion BTU versus 6.8 quadrillion BTU, much, much faster growth rate in China. Okay, so now we get to make our prediction. And so our prediction was about when they had the same, if we look back at the document, our question was when they had the same growth rate. And so we're going to look for the intersection point. If we click on our graphs, we can click on the intersection point. And that is 10.418. So I'm going to write this down and then go back and look at the other number, 10.418, comma, uh, 102.198. All right, so I'm going to label it, and so there is our ordered pair that is the intersection. I just want to label it so I can see it on the graph as well. And so now we need the interpretation in this. This is when the two lines intersect, so it's when they give us the same amount of energy consumption. And I have our year value as the T, so that's the first thing I'll say is, I'm not going to say in 10 years, instead we're going to give the year. So it's been 10 years since 2000, so we're going to say in 2010, the U.S. and China will both produce 102.198 quadrillion BTUs of energy. Okay. We could get a little more information out of this if we wanted to say that before 2010, the U.S. was producing more energy. It's higher before 2010, and then after 2010. China produces more energy, the China graph has surpassed the U.S.'s growth rate. Alright, so just some language practice, making sure when I talk about slope, I put units, I want these full sentences like this that have the context and the values and the units all together in a single place. So you don't have to do all the folders, I was just doing that to try to keep it organized as we were looking through this example together. So I'm going to send you a copy of this example along with this video. Uh, to help give you an explanation of what I'm looking for when we do things that deal with regressions.